Hello and welcome to another edition of Mad Mondays with Patrick and Celeste, where our Mondays are so mad that we have to broadcast on Thursdays. Now, unfortunately, Celeste is unable to be with us again today, so I'll be bringing you a wrap-up of what has been a huge week in sport. So we'll start with some um, good news to start. We'll start with the soccer. So the Socceroos on Tuesday night won through to the World Cup, which is their third successive World Cup, and became the second team to qualify for the 2014 event to be held in Brazil. Australia needed to win their game against Iraq on Tuesday night to qualify along with Japan, and they did so taking the game 1-0 after Josh Kennelly scored in the, 80th, in the 82nd minute after coming on five minutes earlier as the sub for the not-too-happy Tim Cahill. So Kennedy hasn't played an international match since 2011, so he's had a bit of time off and obviously a great way to come back into, come back into the game, scoring the match-winning goal there for Australia. So Australia now joined Brazil as the host, Japan, South Korea and Iran as the teams to qualify so far for the 2014 World Cup. Uh, the World Cup will be held in June next year from June 12th to the 13th of July. So moving on to cricket, Australia will not get a chance to defend their Champions Trophy title after being eliminated in the pool stages after they lost to Sri Lanka the other night. Needing to win and win well by a reasonably big margin told any hope of qualifying for the semi-final stage after a loss to England and a washout against uh, New Zealand. In their set, in their two games previous to that, the Aussies went down by 20 runs, to, 20 runs to the Sri Lankans. So the Sri Lankans batted first and made eight for 253, led by ex-skipper Mahala J. Wardner making 84 not out off of 81 balls. And leading the way for the Aussie bowlers was Mitchell Johnson taking a well-deserved 348 off 10 overs. Australia in reply needed to make that target within 29 overs to reach the to make it into second position in their pool and advance through to semi-finals with England, and unfortunately fell 20 runs short, being all out for 233. Adam Voges, who's had a really good tournament, made 49 off of 62 deliveries, and Glenn Maxwell made 32 off 20 deliveries, um, with Kula Saker taking 3 for 42 off of 9 overs for Sri Lanka. So unfortunately, Australia not getting a chance to advance through to the next stage of the Champions the final Champions League trophy as well, so um, bad luck for them. But and so the final will be contested against England and India after England after both teams had really big wins. England defeating South Africa by seven wickets and India defeating Sri Lanka by eight wickets. So that should be a very good final. Both teams in some good forms and both teams boasting good uh, batting and bowling lineups. So it'll be a really good game to watch. In some good news for the Australians, Michael Clark is suspected to be fit to play in the first Ashes, um, Ashes test on beginning on July 10th. So he's been struggling with a back injury, so he's been in London getting some medical treatment on that, and he should be right to go by the first Ashes test, as I said, beginning on July 10th. He might even be right to play in one of the sides, warm-up matches against one of the county sides, but they'll just they'll play by year and see how that goes. Uh, in other news, Ricky Ponting will be retiring from all forms of cricket as of October after he's played in the Champions League trophy with the Mumbai Indians. So Ricky Ponting's played, been playing for ages and recently retired from international cricket and has been played in for Tasmania in the Sheffield Shield and the one-day comp last year and uh, last season, and but now he's stepping away from all forms after uh, after October, as I said. Okay, moving on to the NBA. The Heat and the Spurs are now tied at 3 all after six games. The Heat won game six, 103 to 100 in overtime, so a very close game there. So game seven is will be played on Friday, and so we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. Moving on to tennis. Aussie former world number one Leighton Hewitt has enjoyed a good lead-up to Wimbledon, reaching the semi-final of the Queen's Championship in London. Hill was eventually defeated in the semis by fifth seed Marin Cilic, 6-4, 4-6, 6-2. The tournament, the tournament was eventually won by Brit Andy Murray, who defeated Cilic 5-7, 7-5, 6-3. 5, Former coach Roger Rashid thinks Hewitt, whose who's last Grand Slam win was at Wimbledon in 2002, believes Hewitt can cause some damage in the men's draw at Wimbledon, which begins next week. 
Um, and I reckon I agree with him. Hewitt's in some good form and always plays well at Wimbledon. So I think if he gets a favourable draw, I reckon we could see him in the quarterfinals, even the semifinals, and pushing some of the the big seeds there. So we'll see how it goes, and fingers crossed. And meanwhile, the other Aussies playing currently playing at the moment. Bernard Tomic has just been, has just lost in the qualifying finals to Gael Monfils in the Eastbourne Championships, while Stoza was knocked out in the second round in the Eastbourne Championships. So unfortunately, no more Aussies in action at the moment. Now, moving on to AFL, where all the big news has been happening this week. It's been a huge week with uh, many huge stories coming, with two in particular huge stories coming out of Melbourne. Firstly, on Monday, Mark Neal, after weeks of speculation, was sacked as Melbourne coach with former Adelaide Crows coach Neil Craig taking over as caretaker coach for the final 10 games of the season. So Neal's demons had only won five games out of the 33 that he coached, and Neal was only 18 months into his three-year contract. So unfortunately for him, it's a bit of a premature end, but it was one that I'm sure a lot of people saw coming. Mark Choco Williams, who is an ex-coach of Port, uh, ex-assistant coach at GWS and current assistant coach at Richmond is the early favourite for the job with Collingwood assistant and coach and former Bulldogs coach Rodney Eade um, also in the hunt as well. This news follows the resignation of President Don McClarty and fellow colleague Stuart Grimshaw on last Friday. So Melbourne can't take a trick at the moment. They're um, struggling with obviously with their on-field form and all these distractions off the field with a new coach and president being uh, re- resigning last Friday. It's not helping the culture there that's obviously struggling at the moment with the with everything that's going on and it's bad news for them. But hopefully they'll move on. And I think um, my pick, I think, would be Mark Choco Williams or even Rodney E to do a good job. I think, but. So I think either of those two. I think Melbourne need a good, experienced coach to come in. I don't think Mark Neal, with the with the side that Melbourne had, it's a very young side, and I think they needed just needed that extra experience to sort of m- develop that list a little bit more. And Mark Neal coming in as a first year coach, I don't think was the right person to take the reins. But <clears throat> he's had a he's had a crack at it, and obviously couldn't do the job. So. And obviously, there's blokes like the Scott brothers and Brendan Sanderson, who are who are young coaches who have come in and done really good things with their with their respective teams. So it was obviously worth the crack, but um, unfortunately for the Demons, it didn't quite come off this time. Then on Tuesday, St Kilda goal, ste- goal sneak Stephen Milne was charged with four counts of rape after police reinvestigated charges laid against Milne and teammate Lee Montagna back in 2004. So Milne is due to face court on July the 5th. Specialist, specialist detectives from the elite sexual crime squad have spent the past year building a case against Milne after in 2010, detectives from the Brighton CIU who investigated the rape allegations in 2004 went public with claims that the rape charges they recommended against Milne in 2004 collapsed amid threats and intimidation from, the, from inside the Victorian Police Department by powerful backers of the St Kilda Football Club. The then 19-year-old girl thought she was having consensual sex with Lee Montagna, whose house they were at, but when she found out it was Milne, she told him repeatedly to stop, but he continued to to keep going. <clears throat> Milne has been suspended indefinitely by the St Kilda Football Club, which is expected to be around about two weeks, so he'll come back after women's round in a couple of weeks' time. After St Kilda held two crisis meetings, one on Tuesday and one on Wednesday. So skipper Nick Rewalt on midfielder Nick Del Santo, who both play their 250th games this weekend, are both furious men will miss the, this weekend's game against the struggling Melbourne, Melbourne Football Club. Rewalt was saying that, that Stephen Milne is the heart of the club and only would have only the... Yeah. So he, he'll be a, a big loss there for those guys. Reports are there are many reports that this may mean that Milne's football career is over with this suspension. So we'll have to keep an eye on that, and we'll keep you posted in the coming weeks as to the developments of that. Now, Wednesday night there was a meeting held in Adelaide between the Crows, the Power, and SNFL clubs to to sort of suss out what's going on with what's going to go on with the reserve sides next year in the SNFL, or whether they're allowed to be in the SNFL. 
And the only thing that came out of that meeting was that a six, to, a six out of eight vote will be needed in order to pass the motion for both SA-based teams to have reserve sides in the SNFL next year. So <clears throat> only eight of the SNFL clubs have a vote with the Port Adelaide Magpies obviously being affiliated as one club with the Port Adelaide Power, so they don't have a vote. So the eight other SNFL clubs, the six out of them have to say yes for a motion to be passed. <clears throat> so we'll keep an eye on that, and there's expected to be a vote or a decision within the next couple of months. So they've got to they've got to deal with that, as well as the move to Adelaide Oval, as well as relinquishing the license back to the AFL clubs. So there's a lot on their plate at the moment, so we'll have to keep an eye out and see what happens on that. So, moving on to the round 12 results. Friday, last Friday night, saw Hawthorne take on Carlton. Hawthorne 15-12, 102 defeated Carlton 13-9-87 at Etihad Stadium. So Carlton led for a large portion of that match and unfortunately they were unable to hold on to their lead and Hawthorne ran over the top of them in the last quarter to clinch the win there. So Carlton... They've, had, they've been in winning um, opportunities in many games this year, but haven't been, able to, haven't been able to take run out games, unfortunately, for them. So they're going to need to fix that up if they're going to push for finals in the next couple of weeks and, and have an impact in, in finals as well. And last Saturday, we had Richmond take on Adelaide at the MCG. Richmond getting up there 16-14-110 to Adelaide 10-12-72. So... Adelaide's bad form before the bye continues, so that's their third straight loss, obviously losing to Fremantle and Sydney in previous weeks, both here uh, in Adelaide, and now a loss, a heavy loss to Richmond over there. It's There was some very interesting tac- well, tactical moves in the game. Brett Delidio was left as a free man across halfback for Richmond and chalked up tw- uh, 17 disposals. In the first half, this was after Dan Hanabry had 28 disposals in the first half against the Crows the week before. So there's it's there's been talk that Brenton Sanderson was out coached by Damien Hardwick and that he's unable to make the right decisions quickly enough. Which I think it's probably a bit of a harsh criticism, but he, I think it's not just him. I think all the coaches in the coaches box have to take responsibility as well as the players as well. It's their job to spot that. Delidio is getting getting the ball. Surely, if Delidio gets the ball, oh, he's got a kick. Oh, he's got another kick. Surely, you've got to figure that you've got to put someone on him, man up. So, eventually, at half time, they put Van Berlo on him. But by then, the damage had already been done, and the Crows were already well down on the scoreboard. Anyway, moving on to the next game, Fremantle defeated the Brisbane Lions at Pattinson Stadium, twelve goals, fourteen eighty six to six goals, ten forty six. So Brisbane's Bad form continues, but good news for them. They'll get skipper Jonathan Brown back and key defender Daniel Merritt back from suspension this week as well as Brett Maloney from injury as well. So that'll be a couple of big ins for for them this week, but we'll move on to those games in a second. Uh, Essendon defeated the Gold Coast at Etihad Stadium last Saturday night, 17 goals, 13, 115 to the Gold Coast, 11 goals, 6, 72. The young gun, Jager O'Meara, enhanced his claims to win the NAB Rising Star Award overall by having a 30 disposal game and playing a really good game by all accounts so I think he I reckon he's the the favorite at the moment to win the NAB Rising Star award this year but we'll have to wait and see what happens there on Sunday we had GWS playing Port Adelaide at Skoda Stadium and Port Adelaide snapping their five game losing streak defeating GWS 19 goals 11 125 to 6 goals 14 50 so GWS's long run without a win continues. And then the Twilight game last Sunday saw Collingwood take on the Bulldogs and Collingwood getting up there 15-9-99 to the Bulldogs 9-11-65 with Geelong, Melbourne, Kangaroos, St Kilda, Sydney and West Coast having the bye last week. <clears throat> so that brings us to round 13 this week. So to Friday night we have Hawthorne versus West Coast at Etihad Stadium. There's been a lot of talk around Buddy and what he's going to be doing next year. He's put off contract talks and there's growing speculation and the speculation is growing more and more each day that he's going to be moving to Greater Western Sydney for a lot of money. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. Saturday sees Port Adelaide take on Sydney at Amy Stadium. Now that'll be an interesting game because Kurt Tibbet, who went from the Crows to Sydney at the end of last season in a very controversial deal with which cost Stephen Trigg 
his place at the Crows for six months and uh, gave Kurt Tibbet an 11-week ban. So this will be his first game back after the ban, after the dodgy dodgy um, contract talks there with, with Adelaide. So it would be interesting to see how many Crows supporters get down to Amy Stadium to, to jeer Kurt Tibbet. But we'll see how that goes. Uh, St Kilda take on Melbourne at the MCG in a twilight game. And that, as I mentioned before, will be Nick Rewalt and Nick Del Santo's 250th game. So good luck to them. The Western Bulldogs take on Richmond at Etihad Stadium on Saturday night. On Sunday, we have Fremantle versus the Kangaroos at Pattinson Stadium. Brisbane and Brisbane versus Geelong at the Gabba in a twilight game. So I think my tips for this week will be Hawthorne to beat West Coast. Sydney to beat Port Adelaide, St Kilda to beat Melbourne, Richmond to beat the Bulldogs, Fremantle to beat the Kangaroos, Geelong to beat Brisbane. So, and we have Adelaide, Essendon, Gold Coast, GWS, Carlton and Collingwood with the buys. So another big round of football there for the last week of buys and then next week we'll be back to normal fixtures again. So, yeah, and that's all we have time for on the wrap-up for Man Mondays for this week. So... You can listen to us on Ozsports Online or Spreaker. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter uh, at Mad Mondays 13. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you all next week.